Hi everyone, my name is James Lin. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Washington. Uh, today we have a very special talk by Professor He Ming Shou. Professor He is a professor of sociology at National Taiwan University. Uh, he'll be talking to us today about his uh, recently published book, Challenging Beijing's Mandate of Heaven. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Professor He so you can go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you. Uh, really, it's really my honor and pleasure to share with you my uh, some of my observation in the book I published last year. It's about two social protests uh, in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong happening in 2014. But before that, let me share my, my presentation file with you. Is, is it good on everyone's screen? Because I'm, it's good on my end, but I'm only sure. Is, is that good for you? Yes, we can view it. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so it's a book about uh, two student-led protest movement in, in 2014. So the, um, the main talk, my, my talk will be mainly about what, have, what I wrote in that book. But in the concluding part, I want to spend some time to extend my observation to what happened last year in Hong Kong, the anti-extradition protest. And, by using the framework I provided in this book, so to make a connection to what, what is still ongoing right now. So the book is titled uh, Challenging Bandits of Beijing's Mandate of Heaven. Um, uh, let me explain a little bit about the title. The Mandate of Heaven, as probably you, you know, is it comes from the political uh, tra traditional Chinese political philosophy, which basically means the legitimacy of a ruling power that the, the, the mandate was given to heaven. So I choose this title not just to, to be provocative, but I want to highlight the extraordinary quality of two protest movement in 2014, especially in the context of a rising China, and like all rising superpower, you try to change the try to challenge the status quo. But I think there is an exceptional quality with the China rise that it, it actually comes with a narrative of so-called Tianxia, which basically means a China-centered world system. That is uh, not, 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 a sense of, not a sense principle that we have operated right now with the, basically a formal equality of nation states. So basically it's a very China-centered exceptionalism. And I, I want to emphasize this context because if we put Taiwan and Hong Kong together, which are sort of part of the greater China, uh, no matter how you define, and also geologically they are on the periphery, I think it's quite interesting because both society used to be the frontier of Chinese advantageization and both society were deeply formed by the long colonial uh, uh, legacy. And in these two protests, I want to emphasize that uh, civil society or student-led protests can sometimes emerge as an actor upon ge geopolitics. So it's a, there's a spear over from what happened in the gathering and writing and protest. So uh, let me quickly introduce the, the main topics of my, my, my book. That, that In Taiwan, we call it some flower movement. It, was, it got started in 2000. Uh, involved a uh, 24 days occupation of the legislature. And the sticking point was a free trade agreement with China. It was called cross trade service trade agreement. And that was pushed by the ruling party at that time, that, was, that is forming down. And what happened is that the, the ruling party uses majority to push through in the legislature in, in, in a violation of the, uh, the procedure. And the next day, students just rush into the, 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 the legislature, and um, the protest just unexpectedly involved into more than three weeks confrontation. And what happened in Hong Kong later in that year was called Umbrella Movement. The issue was about that Hong Kong people want to have genuine sovereignty of their chief executives. And it became a, 20, a 79 days of occupation on the road and involving three, three major uh, occupation areas. Um, so being a, a, a student of social movement, I'm of course thrilled by the development happening in the same year. Um, and, and they share so many similarities that make this comparison a worthy project. Like both of them challenging the Beijing's political agenda. In Taiwan, Beijing has said that explicitly that he wants to promote unification 
via economic integration. So a lot of incentives have been given to Taiwan, and that, that free, uh, the free trade agreement, which did, which because of apartheid did not really went into effect, was one of them. And in Hong Kong, since the city's uh, handover to Chinese sovereignty in 1997, there have been a tendency that Beijing wants to tighten its control because they were kind of, uh, the Beijing ruler were kind of skeptical of the loyalty of the Hong Kong elites. And because, and um, um, uh, in these two parties, because the Taiwan, what happened in Taiwan come first, the earlier in that year. So there is a visible demonstration event to Hong Kong people. So, so when the Hong Kong people took, took the streets in the, in the autumn that year, they put it in mind is a Taiwan model. Also, they, there are some structural similarities that both are student-led massive civil disobedience. Uh, and, but the conclusion are different because in Taiwan, the student and the parties have decided to withdraw from the, from the legislature voluntarily and even claim that they have a victory. But what I mean in Hong Kong is that it evolved so long, it dragged on and until the, the, move, the, the people in the occupation zone become fewer and fewer. So the police just clear, clear the, the occupation one by one, so the, and with many people being arrested. So it really and it in collapse. So in the book, I want to my, my my main goal was to understand the genesis, is the process and the outcome of these two unusual protests. Um, and also, I want to integrate different levels of analysis, the, the micro level, uh, which are, by which I mean the interpersonal relationship. Because before the, these two protests, uh, several years before that, that, you see that young people have been more and more active and they've become networking with each other. Even Hong Kong protesters have become networking with those counterparts in Taiwan. So I want to understand how this uh, uh, um, process has been built on until the eruption of these two protests. And also I want to answer, uh, look at the meso level, which I mean inter-organizational, inter because even they are student-led protests, they have been interaction with students, with NGO, with political party, and in Hong Kong's case, you see actually students, delegates have a negotiation with the government. So that's a meso level. And also I want to look at the macro level, of, at the stru state structure and the geopolitics. So the different levels of analysis are, are there in my book. So, and also being a student of social movement, I, I think existing study had created a level of wealth of vocabulary. But I think these two projects are, are kind of has certain novel quality that I, I think I, we need to come up with more framework to understand the, the, the dynamic of contemporary activities. And so I, two, two major concepts I want to uh, develop here in this book are stand up and improvisation. I will come to that later. So this is the contents of pretty much the beginning and a process and a pro and an and a, and a, and a, and a outcome. So uh, begin my, before my analysis, I want to use the, the perspective of so-called eventful protests. That is a concept that try to make sense of some of the unusual protests because in democracy, protests could be a very routine a normalized event that you don't even raise an eyebrow when you see people were doing that protest on the street. But there are certain category of protests that in this history-making moment, people actually act in violation of their routines. They, they defy the structure. They, they do something that can, they never thought before. So these are the intensive moments. So to use the, the, the historian William Sewell's Su term, it's called eventful protest. He was referring to certain moments like the storming of Bastille in, in French Revolution. So these are the uh, un, a rare but intensive transformative and, and effort-making uh, moment. So in a number of, in recent history, you can say that, like, for example, like East European Revolution in 89, and also Arab Spring in 2011, uh, are this case. And in this book, I want to, under, want to, want to emphasize that uh, some brown movement and umbrella movement in, Hong Kong, in Taiwan and Hong Kong are these rare categories. Um, so before before we under uh, also this is the background. So um, I think it's quite interesting to see the growing presence of China in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan in the recent few decades. But I want to, one one of the uh, key issue I want to emphasize in my book uh, that was part of the background to this project is that 
Chinese government have been have been using economics incentive to create local collaborators, and they, these are what I call you economic united front strategy, which they they practice first in the 80s in Hong Kong, and then expand that in Taiwan since the 90s. So, so over the years, with closer economic integration with Hong Kong and Taiwan with the mainland China, and also they come with a political effect. And I, I want to quote Xu Jiatun. He is the top communist official sent to Hong Kong since the 80s. And he, after he left Hong Kong because of the Tiananmen incident, he published a very revealing uh, memoir in, in the United States. He just said that explicitly. He said that we should use our resources to cultivate a group of China capitalists. We should learn from we use the resources in the mainland, which are actually more, much larger, to gain popular support and contribute to the continuing Hong Kong's uh, so he said explicitly, except that right now we all know what, what, what China is doing globally. Since 2017, the, the so-called popular shock power have been quite popular. But look at look back historically, you see what happened in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, they are really the early manifestation of shock power of China's influence campaign in the, in, in the society beyond the direct, indirect, beyond the direct control. So over the years, they have created some problems, issues in societies. And also since these two protests are led by, by young people and like many contemporary protest movements elsewhere in the world, but I want to emphasize in Hong Kong and Taiwan context, there are some unusual aspects. First, in Chinese political philosophy or tradition, student protests had to have a political a special political law because they were usually seen as the moral conscience of the society. And that has been in the tradition of the main force movement in the 1990s. And I, I think certain kind of that tradition is still alive in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan. But aside from that, these are also the parties of young people, but in particular the millennial generation. So in Hong Kong, they, they have been talked about post 80s. In Taiwan, we, we, we call it seventh grader. It's difficult to explain why the seventh grader was not involved with Republic of China current Ningbo. But actually, they are the same people, those who were born in the 80s. And when they came of the age, probably in, in the newer century, and they experienced some economic grievances in two society. I think they are true. Uh, it is true. It's a very fundamental experience of being this generation or cohort in Hong Kong and Taiwan. In Taiwan, it, they will talk about, they have been a lot of talk about the stagnation of wages. And in Hong Kong, they have been talk, a lot of talk about the rising housing price that college graduates can never expect to buy apartment in, in, their, in their working career. So, so you, you see that talk prior to the eruption of these two parties. Also, um, in, in a number of parties before that, you see a lot of young people get involved in a number of issues, anti-eviction, anti-nuclear power, or anti-development projects, like, things like that. And in a lot of narrative, we see these generational uh, activists actually articulate their, 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 their philosophy, they emphasize that they, they, they want to pursue a value of authenticity and truthfulness. And sometimes they question the very value of, 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 of pursuing economic development at all costs. So you see that coming together before the, these two parties. And also, I want to emphasize that when these two parties emerge, not, that happen not because of the opportunity, but because of threat. And these are the set of concepts that we often use in anal analyzing social movement. Political opportunity means that the cost of the action is lower. That's why people want to join the action. But the threat is different. It means that people suddenly realize they, this is the moment they have to act before it is too late. So the threat actually is defined the cause of inaction. So these two parties actually taken took place in exactly the moment when the opportunity will vanish. So look at the context when students rush into the legislature. That happened on the second day after the ruling party pushing the, the, the trade agreement. So it's almost, it finished the second reading, it's almost a done deal. But and protesters have been spent several months without able to stop that, that, that that agreement, but because of the, the, the forcible pushing, they, they found an, an imperative. They found imperative to do something. Also, because once they were in the in the in also once they were in the legislature, people really 
from all over places in Taiwan just gather together outside of the legislature to protect it. That, that's really the, 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 the very beginning of some fraud movement. In the case of Hong Kong, because there have been protests going on, but what happened in, on September 28th, the police started to use tear gas and people suddenly kind of scandalized and outraged. And people were saying that you should not do this to, to unarmed citizens. And they were just students. So, so spontaneous sit in just took place without leaders making that demand. So looking back, these two protests took place not because the movement was strong. Actually, they were kind of losing their steam and then the, the, the government just ignored their demand. But what happened is that the incumbent just made a mistake. And it, it just make it, make it possible for protesters to, to escalate their confrontation. So these are the uh, uh, facial presentation of, of two protests. Uh, I want to use this to demonstrate why we, why Taiwan have a strong leadership of the movement out its occupation period, whereas in Hong Kong it was much weaker. So look at the, on the left left side is actually a, a reproduction of what happened. The, the main action, the main main activism just happened in the area around legislature, which is not actually it's, it's in the center of Taipei, but it's not a very uh, commercialized area. So still was inside a building and they were surrounded by police and on the outside on the two street, uh, two, two street of world paper, uh, people. So actually it's a political area in Taiwan. So, but outside of that, uh, just normal life went on. And so, so it's, it's a political crisis without involving into a social, social crisis. But what happened in Hong Kong is actually a three, uh, non contiguous areas of occupation. The first, the one, first one is at the minority, which is the epicenter of the whole project. And there's also another one in Causeway Bay. Both of them are Hong Kong Island, and Causeway Bay is a famous shopping area. And Mong Kok is further in Baolong Peninsula, which is more a little bit working class, but also very commercialized. So you see three, three, three areas just emerge on the night when police start to use the tear gate. So you create a lot of difficulty in coordinating, and still the leader were just only able to speak to the people on at the minority. That, that really is a is a is a, is a, a, a problem for the movement throughout its existence. So I want to emphasize that uh, because it's an, an unusual characteristic. So the, once the movement emerged, you, you force the government to have to look at it rather than ignoring. So there is a you know, kind of de facto bargaining of that. And once the movement uh, coming back, you see that the leader actually uh, take more aggressive demands. So prior before the Sun Pro movement, the student just want to uh, go back to the procedure to review the, the agreement article by article. And once they took control of the legislature, they want the, the, the agreement to be scrapped. And also, like the case in Hong Kong, once uh, some umbrella movement was in existence, the, the protestant want the, the top leader to step down. And also, uh, because of the continued occupation, you see that people out, outside there and the grassroots are become more and more militant. They want to do something. They, they become more and more impatient. But you look at the, you look at the, the poll in the, of the public support, that if it is continue to sustain there, actually it's become increasingly unfavorable to the protester. So look at the poll that probably uh, around the third week that people will really change their, their, their attitude. Because in the beginning, citizens will support you because they think the government do the best thing. But once the occupation become prolonged, especially in the case of Hong Kong, people's everyday life was disrupted. The traffic was difficult and school was closed. So they, they become more impatient with the protest. Oh, and also the prolonged this encampment uh, persisted. They were vulnerable to the pro government violence, usually mobster will attack them. So it become, in the very beginning, you were offensive, but now you will become you kind of in a, in a dilemma that you have to defend your, your occupation zone. Okay. So in the middle of the puzzle, you see both leaders will try to find a third an exit strategy. Uh, they want to readjust their demand and find some way and, and execute to, to stop the occupation without, without without breaking down the morale. But what happens in Taiwan is that we have very strong leadership, so they can execute an order. 
that we should leave. But in case of Hong Kong, they have been searching that for weeks and until that the, the movement just run out of steam and just collapsed. So, and also, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, this movement really, two cases really provide us a uh, case for rethinking the social movement vocabulary because we used to use a classical image that a movement is led by a certain organization. They, it's, so that's why we call mobilization because it's very disciplined and uh, focused. But on the, on the other hand, more recently, we have seen a lot of so-called horizontalism, meaning that they are leaderless movements, especially in the case of Occupy Wall Street in 2011. But on these two cases, I think it's somewhere in between because we, we have leaders there in these two movements, and they spoke to the government, they represent the movement. And, okay. and, but on the other hand, they don't take care of a lot of things. So their decision-making will actually constrain so uh, these move, two movements are made possible by a lot of people who respond to the demand, and that demand can come in many shapes, uh, to make it possible. So that's why I use the term improvisation. It was defined as strategic response with of prior planning. So you see, uh, this is uh, very decentralized. On the surface, it's very decentralized, although you have a decision-making code. But the decision-making code are not taking care of every, every, many, many, many issues. So like, let me give you some sense of what I call improvisation, because that really came out of a sense of emergency, uh, urgency. So in Taiwan, we say we have to save our own nation by ourselves. So it's really like a post-disaster uh, volunteer campaign that you have to act, otherwise it will be too late. And in both cases, we see kind of an upside down image emerge in this encampment area. That it becomes a utopia. In, in, in Hong Kong and in Taiwan as well, people were helping each other and take care of each other. And, and you know, especially in Hong Kong, it's so a commercialized city that, that but there you, you, you really can spend the whole day without spending money, spending a dollar, and everything is provided for free, and everybody taking care of it. And, and because it's a long hour later, so people will try to devote themselves to some creative, creative activity, they do some drawing, painting, create some artworks. and a lot of self-expressive activity going on there. And also, improvising are very important. A lot of resources are, are provided like for people, water, and, and are Actually, the name of these two movements, sunflowers and umbrellas, are actually provided by volunteers, unknown volunteers. So that's why it got its name by the, in the media. And also because people will lay off spending long hours. And so a lot of activity has to be held to sort of entertain the people, to encourage people to prolong their stay. Like in both cases, a lot of professors been doing strict lecturing there. Um, also, I think it's kind of strategic layer because they want to, participate, want to provide an image of stability, even though they were disrupting the public order, even though they were challenging the political authority, they want to present this image that they are good citizens, for example, like garbage collection and resources for. I mean, they are necessary to keep the hygiene, but at the same time, they also show their civic mindedness. And also, students continue their study there in both cases. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a strategy to deflect the, the challenges that students just give up this, the, the, the duty of a study, to keep out, uh, and they were so attracted to some excitement on the street. No, they, so it's a good argument that students they continue their study. Okay. And also, in, in both cases, I, I think. But they try to present the image of inclusivity. So certain category of people's presence were highlighted. That like in the case of Hong Kong, people with disability and South Asians uh, were, were specially highlighted. Also in the same case in Taiwan, indigenous people in Taiwan were kind of put out in a spotlight to emphasize that we are very inclusive. We are inclusive from. And also after the end of the movement, I want to call attention to a, a particular process because we actually there have been very few uh, attention to the emotional outcome of movement activity, especially these intense activism. So in, in both cases, a lot of activists find difficulty to adjusting to normal life, and a lot of PTSD symptoms actually among the leaders, and they are sense of guilt, and so they become withdrawn to themselves for several months, and they avoid contact. And so actually a lot of group hearing and also involvement of spiritualities were involved, especially, especially among the core, core activists. And also in their personal life, they have a lot of unexpected terms. 
So in the case of Taiwan, I know people who suddenly get married after the party, and also I know people who suddenly decided not to get married out of that. So things like that happen because it's involved intensive participation that really change your life. And also I want to emphasize that even the Occupy ended, but they are continuing legacy, the afterlife. So newer protests have been engendered in both Taiwan and Hong Kong. And in both cases, that activists, after ending the, the actual institutional activity, they, they turn their attention to election. So in both cases, in Taiwan and Hong Kong, that you see new party formed. Um, in, 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 in Hong Kong, it was usually, at that time, it was called Umbrella Social. In the case of Taiwan, it was called Third Forces. But actually, they, they represent the same young people, and they, they were drawn to the political arena, and they become politicians as a, as a, as a result. And also, um, I think there's a difference in the case of in Hong Kong, because in a Hong Kong opposition, it's a fractured, and so the so-called pandemic. So none of these activists actually joined the pandemic. They formed their own party, like Joshua Wong, who is a famous and no, and but in the case of Taiwan, you've actually you see new, par new parties, like New Power Party. But actually, a lot of activists joined the DPP, which was a, a position in 2014, but came to power in 2016. I think the, num the, the most famous will be Lin Peifang, who is actually a deputy secretary, secretary, uh, uh, secretary of DPP since last year. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me. Come to the conclusion. This is actually the, the sentence I quote here is the, the very last sentence I put in my book. Uh, I, I, I just said that I think that uh, Soviet uh, leader three decades ago, Xi Jinping, now is facing a Polish problem in his backyard as a result of two eventful problems in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Because I, I put this because at, that at the time of writing, it was, I, I wrote this sentence in 2018, I guess, and the book came out in 2019. Because of the, the closest historical analogy I came to mind would be this. Polish side every movement. That was a major change to the to the communist regime at the time, and it was create such a momentum, but it ended in total collapse, and the leader were taken to prison. But looking back at the transformation of East Europe and the collapse of Soviet, you, you see that you have to trace the, real, the transformation back to the Polish example. So I, I, I have this in mind because when I was in Hong Kong at the time, a lot of people were put in, into jail because of the involvement of the umbrella, uh, umbrella movement. And in, to, in 2018, um, Hong Kong's civil society were really in this low tide. But maybe, I, I try to emphasize that maybe that, that would be the uh, close analogy because uh, you have a protest surge and then it failed and people were facing reprisal from the government. Maybe this is just a low tide. But, but on Taiwan, I think because the, coming to power of DPP in 2016, and that they win the re-election earlier this year. I think it really changed the dynamics. And so these two parties actually reconfigured really Ta Beijing, Taiwan, Hong Kong triangle a lot. So we were actually living in the aftermath of these two parties. Okay, that, that is the, uh, the, my book. Do I have more minutes so I can expand to my observation to the Hong Kong parties last year? Because yes, I, please, I'm, go ahead. How many minutes do I have? Okay, I, I, okay, I just uh, try not to spend more than uh, 10 minutes. So, uh, so as we all know, we, uh, they emerged a very powerful anti-extradition party last year in Hong Kong. It really exploded in last summer. So what I'm going to do is that I use some vocabulary and framework to make sense of what happened in 2014, but I want to extend that to, to what happened in 2019. So first, threat. As I said, the, the, the umbrella movement does not emerge because of opportunity, but because of the heightened sense of threat that you have to act, otherwise your city will be losing uh, uh, everything, the rule of law, tradition, et cetera, et cetera. And in the case of the Hong Kong 2019, I think the, the threat actually is higher because it's about an extradition issue. So everyone could be extradited to, to China. Actually, that's, that's much more urgent. In 2014, people when they say, okay, if we can now have a genuine election of top leadership, okay, it just stayed the same. We just did not fail, we, we just failed to move a step forward in the direction of democracy. But this time, it's everyone's uh, safety put in danger. And also, so you look at the last summer, a lot of talk about end game, and people really commit suicide because of that. 
So you see that how urgent that is. And also the same thing that uh, when, when parties emerged last summer, there is no favorable political opportunity. The opposition seats were actually fewer and the leader was more united and et cetera. And Hong Kong civil society had been, has been battered. And also umbrella leader, including Joshua Wong, was in jail at that time. And also look at the generation. As I said, in, two, uh, in 2014, it was a post-80s and a little bit post-90s. But you look at people got arrested since last year, as, as early as 11 year old, 12 years old. These people are actually born in the new century. So you, it's just five years apart, but you see that the, the young people got involved will become much, much younger. Uh, they are in the, the, in the middle school. And also, I think the same dynamic of incumbent mistake were working there. Because in the first uh, demonstration of one million people that took place in June 9, the very moment after the, the demonstration was ended, uh, uh, the government just issued an announcement that they are going to proceed with the review of that the, the legislation, legislation. So that really keep people emer emerging. Also, on, on the June 12, that is the, the day when when protesters surrounded the legislators to prevent the review of that threat. And people just, uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong government we adopt a very repressive stance that they, they just declare these people are going to be indicted under the charge of right, which is a very severe crime. So, and over the summer, you see the excessive use of force, uh, collusion was against, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, that really fanned the, the people's anger. So, so when the, bis, the bill was whistled in on September, the movement just continued for several months, so you see it's too late to stop everything. And also it's because of, Umbrella was an occupied protest, but anti shooting is kind of different. That's why they call be water, because they just protest, and once the police have the dominance, they just withdraw. So there's no occupation, occupy uh, public places. So it's a kind of different dynamic of stand, uh, stand up. Because as I said, the stand up is actually self-defeating in the long don't turn for protesters uh, for a number of reasons. The morale will decline and people will lose interest and people will lose their support as well. But, but after, but in this kind of a be so-called be water protest, there is no fatigue and no need to find an actual strategy. And actually it's a protest by weekend and for a certain period of time. So it's very unusual. Uh, some people will still have them, the, the mil militancy, they can continue to do that without being fatigued. And also, um, the most important thing in most deep, one of the most different aspects of in the anti extradition party is that there is no movement figurehead, no leadership, no so called no main stage. So, we saw that actually there are more latitude for improvisation. So, for example, they try to blockade the airport for several times and they demonstrate a human chain rally and a thing in a shopping mall, which is a very unique, special strategy to make use of the Hong Kong union in the urban landscape. And also, uh, in spite of that, I think uh, there's no, in spite of the fact that there's no leaders there, but I think the pre-existing organizing are still important. For example, like Civil Rights Human Front, which is a very important NGO in Hong Kong's context. Uh, they were uh, in their rally and demonstration, more, more and more people will join. And also, Trade union are very important for a number of strikes and, and so on. So what I, I say is, I think it would be too early or too quick to say this is an entirely leaderless movement. What I was, I think it's better to categorize leaders' function have been parcel out. Like Joshua Wong, then so I've been a cultural, a political ambassador on a lot of international fronts, etc. And, and uh, okay, um, so. Um, I want to emphasize that this is a very resilient movement in spite of the repression, in spite of the COVID-19 since this year, and also the national security law since this summer. So at its anniversary in June, so there have been more than 900 people being arrested, uh, more close to 2,000 being persecuted, more than 100 being sentenced. And look at the casualty, that's very un un unusual, uh, at least 10 deaths. So this included uh, suspicious suicide, party suicide, and uh, at least 1,000 refugees uh, internationally. So, so and now, and now uh, I, I think Hong Kong is, right now, the city is in a sort of martial law situation right, uh, control right now. Um, but you see the movement 
kind of move dynamic uh, moment and it was still there even though it's still not it, even though it is not on the street so you see different fronts have been created like for example people the so-called yellow economic circle the people patronize pro movement uh, stores and also people were using uh, organizing a labor union or also the picture here people will buy apple daily in quantity just to distribute it because apple daily had been the only one anti the only anti-communist uh, news outlet in Hong Kong. So even buying a newspaper can be a gesture of defiance there. And also on an international front, a lot of the diasporic community are organizing and lobbying for sanctioned from foreign countries. So I think there is a, mo a dilemma for the moment, how to de maintain its defiance uh, in the escalating related to repression to uh, minimize their loss. And so that, that's something I think is really worthy following up. So I end my talk here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor He. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity now to offer some time for questions. Can you talk about the role of police and police violence in each protest situation? Uh, police and police violence in, in 2019 or 2014? Both. Uh, well, I, I think, well, let me speak to Taiwan. I think Taiwan has been used to a mild form of policing. So actually, uh, well, throughout the time for our movement, there was an incident of, of, of confrontation in the executive UN. And police do use force to evacuate protesters, and more than 500 people were, were injured. And there have been lawsuits filed by both sides. But that was the most violent incident uh, in, throughout the whole episode. But but comparatively, actually, it's milder because if you look at what happened in Hong Kong in 2014, actually, the, the, the use of tear gas was the triggering point of umbrella movement. Uh, but after learning the umbrella, the lesson of umbrella movement, I think Hong Kong people, Hong Kong police will try to escalate their tactic. They become more pre preventive, uh, preventive and more aggressive. That's how you see that the every, very moment of the movement emergence earlier last year in June, in Ju as I said, on June 12, when people were, were protesting outside of the legislature. Uh, on, this, on that day, police used more than 450 canisters of tear gas. The, actually, the number outnumbered what happened in, in 2014. So you see that police escalate its repression at a very moment. And throughout the summer, you see a lot of weapons being used. And by the, to, to last fall, Hong Kong police did not have a water cannon. But they brought that and they get that equipment immediately after the, uh, the, the protest. And so you see that, and a lot of experienced narrative told by those who were being arrested, you know, they were using a lot of what I call dirty, dirty tactics to, to targeting uh, these police. So police, what of, uh, Police uh, violence, police brutality was definitely the issue of, of last year's project and which is continuing right now. Can you comment on the necessity of specific demands, the survival and success of a protest? For example, the five demands that were made during the extradition protests. Uh, well, well, that's a good question. Uh, well, sometimes survival and su success of movement are different things. A movement survived because its demands are difficult to meet, to be met. That's the case of last year's Hong Kong protest, right? Five demands, the first one actually had been met, the whistle of that extradition bill. But, and then the three other demands are related to the uh, prosecution police force and an inquiry into the police. Okay, these are the policing issues. And the last demand is democratization by two double the regulation, meaning the full election of the legislature in Hong Kong, and also the uh, popular election of the top leadership. This is a dem democratization demand. So, so actually, um, uh, it's very difficult to to evaluate, to evaluate, to have an uh, understanding that which which demand are most important in the mind of protest itself. But as I would say that the witnessing the police uh, forces last summer was really a, dry, a, 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 a driving force for, for people continuing to protest. So in a sense, it's very difficult to say that movement is successful or not. 
But you look at what happens is really, for example, like the extradition bill. You will the turn the turn clock back to the last summer. You, actually, no one will predict it will be withdrawn. But it did. But the movement on the movement side does not think it's a success at all because they say they have other demands. So and also you you will observe from this year that you have national security law being implemented in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong basically is now becoming more and more like a mainland city. Does that represent movement success? So it's very difficult to define. So instead of finding an elusive uh, definition uh, of success or failure, I think it's better to look at the interaction of partisan and government and see how they will plan out uh, in the future. So that's my quick response. Beijing has blamed, quote, outside agitators, in quote, for events in Hong Kong. And now we see the geopolitical conflict unfolding between Beijing and Washington over Taiwan. To what extent is the U.S. a player in the sunflower slash umbrella movements and today? Okay, so this uh, foreign, uh, foreign agitators theory has been there in place for many years. It's kind of a political paranoia of Beijing leaders. Uh, everything in, in Hong Kong was due to foreign intervention. So actually, you look at the narrative last year from coming from an official spokesperson that U.S. and Taiwan are behind the protests. They talked about a lot last year, a lot. Um, but in the case of some brown uh, umbrella movement, I think the, quite interesting is how movement active deal with that. But in the case of Taiwan, um, let's leave Taiwan out of here, okay? Because obviously, U.S. is not involved in some brown movement. Beijing did not make that accusation. But in the case of umbrella movement, uh, Actually, leaders of the movement care about that. That's why they decided to name the movement as Umbrella Movement rather than Umbrella Revolution, as that went viral in the first few days in the Western media. Because if it was an Umbrella Revolution, it's kind of a, it would be more akin to the color revolution. That is definitely a no no for, for Beijing leaders. So in 2014, the movement leaders tried to escalate, downplay. They don't want to uh, make Beijing more uh, suspicious of that. So they, and you see that actually they make a lot of effort to emphasize that they all they want is just democracy in Hong, in Hong Kong. They don't want to get involved in mainland affairs. They don't, they reject uh, foreign, uh, they, they don't want to meet foreign uh, delegates or, or something. This kind of symbolic gesture want to pacify to, to uh, Beijing. But in 2019, actually activists have been lobbying since last summer, have been lobbying foreign country to intervene in Hong Kong's uh, affair. That Joshua Wong had been in Taiwan, and Joshua Wong was in U.S. Senate hearing. So you see the change of mindset. The people just don't care about this kind of force, uh, unreasonable accusation. They just want foreign force to get involved as kind of to change the dynamic of their confrontation with the party. So and of course you, you have national security law. One of its main Crime is like you, you collusion with foreign government, foreign government and outside forces. Outside forces refer to Taiwan. So that that is that's the how I think quite interesting how the protesters see and react to Beijing's paranoia. The 2019-2020 Hong Kong protest tactics have been adopted all over the world, whether they be in the U.S., Belarus, Thailand, Nigeria, Indonesia, uh, especially be water tactics and decentralized leadership often involving Telegram. Do you see this as a global watershed moment in movement strategies and moving toward decentralized leadership in protests in general? Well, that's a good question because, um, well, in a way you can see that the Occupy protests really emerged in 2007, 11, in Arab Spring and in Spain in that summer, in the same year, and Occupy Wall Street was also in the same year. And you had a lot of noted Protests there, like Getty Park Party in Turkey. In 2014, Umbrella and Sun oh, these are belong, these are actually one category, right? They are, they are the occupied protests. The, the defining feature was you occupy a public space for a certain period of time and demanding government to have, do something, okay? But what happened last year is, I'm not sure. People are learning Hong Kong. They are at reference to Hong Kong in a number of places, even in Barcelona, in Thailand, and maybe in, in Ukraine as well. But I think people 
will not know that know that actually a prolonged occupation of public sphere is self defeating in a long time. But I, I, except I'm not sure whether this is a lesson they learned from their previous experience or they just see what happened in Hong Kong. I, what happened in Hong Kong, I think, is unique in the sense that because it's a global city, so many media were stationed there. So, so they, were, they were kind of being broadcast globally, uh, whereas what happened in, in Ukraine may be more severe confrontation involved, but not many people care about that. Well, so, and also the use of the telecom, is, this is an encrypted, uh, encrypted platform, I think is definitely important because I think what happened is that back then, earlier this decade, the government are, are not so well, are not so digitally sophisticated. But over the years, you see China have been very powerful. They, we talk about digital Leninism. They, they create a layer on um, a cyber troll and they, they, in the WeChat, in the Chinese operated media platform, TikTok WeChat, uh, you see they were kind of selling their, st their story of the movement. So, the, the, Dictators have become more digitally sophisticated, so that makes the traditional platform like Facebook uh, kind of kind of neutralize the challenge that that uh, Facebook can provide, where platform like Facebook can provide it to to participants. So they had to use Telegram, which is an encrypted platform. That's I think the adaptation out of that because government becomes smarter, so we have to evolve as well. But I'm not sure. So, so the question is, I'm not entirely sure, I saw the reference to Hong Kong, but I'm not sure how, what happened in, in different area, uh, what happened in the ground, are people really copying Hong Kong model or they were adapting to the same trends uh, which are, are probably universal elsewhere. Would you be able to talk a bit more about the rising sense of regional transnational solidarity within and beyond Asia? I'm thinking specifically of the Milk Tea Alliance. How do you think the political possibility of such cultural sentiments. Oh, well, that's a definitely interesting. Milk Tea Alliance, we just, you know, uh, just yesterday, Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand has a major rally, and on a rally you see Hong Kong flag, Taiwan flag, being hosted by the, by the protester. Or no reason at all, maybe just to, as, as, as a gesture of solidarity. Well, um, I don't have sufficient knowledge to talk about Milk Tea Alliance. Uh, which in part is really driven by the threat of people don't like China. That's one of the number of reasons why. But I think having those same dislike target does not make the solidarity, does not really, it's not really enough force to make an international network uh, continue. That's not enough. But I would say that actually after 2014, there have been some organization among young activists in, involving Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia. It's a kind of pan Asia thing. It's called Young Democrats of, 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 of East Asia or something. And Joshua Wong has been invited to Hong Kong, uh, to like to Thailand and to Mal Malaysia after um, uh, umbrella movement. And on both occasions, they he was re refused to be allowed to enter the border and, uh, because he's not welcome in Malaysia and he's not welcome in Thailand. But on, on these two occasions, he was invited by student activists. So you actually see prior to the eruption of the, the coming to the service of the so-called Community Alliance, I think some network had been there among the leaders, except that it didn't really spread out to the grassroots protesters. So one of the my 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 gesture is that what happened as we see the unfolding of Milky Alliance is actually a uh, there are some groundwork before. It's not just happened on some internet incident coming out of nowhere. So so that's my temporary uh Interesting answer to that question. Uh, it's a worse, it's a worthy phenomenon, uh, interesting phenomenon. I would definitely keep uh, keep watching on. Do you see China making the decision to physically invade Taiwan in attempts to unify it? Uh, I assume also this applies to the probably a greater military kind of presence in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, what is the best case scenario for the citizens of Hong Kong? Is this outcome realistic? I assume this has kind of repercussions for 
um, the future of, of kind of protest movements as well. Well, uh, let me, the military confrontation in Taiwan Strait, uh, let me come to your question. And there have been a lot of political uh, conspiracy theory that because you have uh, U.S. election coming up in few weeks and people are expecting chaos because no one will really know how it will pan out after the people cast a vote and they may be that. So that probably will create a best moment for Beijing to invade Taiwan. <laughs> so they have been, we actually saw the news in Taiwan every day. So I don't know. So <laughs> I cannot know what happened on November 3rd. Um, I don't know. So I, don't, I can read. But we definitely know that uh, uh, a lot of uh, like military activity on, on the side, from the side of Taiwan and PRC and US are become more intensive in this area. So I don't know what will happen out of that. Um, in the case of Hong Kong, I think at the present, I think well, there used to be a thinking that Hong Kong people, let alone, can pursue their democracy if they don't mind uh, mainland business. Uh, they don't want to intervene in the, the mainland. I, I think that's just thinking of umbrella movement leaders. Right? They just don't want the city to be democratic, guys, right? so without really challenging the communist authority in the mainland. Uh, they, but I think uh, this opportunity, this thinking is out of question right now. So uh, because with the national security law implemented in Hong Kong, it become more and more that either Hong Kong get democratized or community regime will collapse. You have these two options only. Either, either communist party take over the city or communist regime collapse and the city become democratized. So you have no other option. So stakes are become higher. I think all the people who have been watching over the development last year, you really drive into a, 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 a either or a dangerous situation. I, I don't know how it will pan out, but I think after the national security law being implemented, uh, overseas Hong Kong activists have stepped up their lobbying. And I think with more, we probably will witness more sanction coming out from different country and that will become a more international affair. The main battleground was no longer in, on the street of Hong Kong. I think uh, it will become a more uh, international affair. Maybe that's, the, that's actually the, the goal of Hong Kong protesters, knowing that they cannot really challenging on the domestic front. That's why they call Lam Chao. Actually, they really have to create a mess that Beijing got directly involved and international sanctions will really put pressure on the regime. At, at least some parties saw so that was the only way for Hong Kong. Otherwise, the, the current situation, without a protest, without a the movement, Hong Kong is just becoming low and dying. Hong Kong is just becoming uh, a regular mainland city without intervention. So maybe that's the, the that's the realization of the what movement has what protester has anticipated is a scenario that they want. I wanted to ask my own kind of follow up question to that, um, uh, Professor Ho. Do you see? Do you see? Uh, this is also in line with another question we have about, you know, what do you think about the impact of the pandemic and the national security law and the protests in Hong Kong? But my own question is, in addition to that, um, now that we see kind of the a lot of the political leaders of the student movements in Hong Kong moving abroad, uh, finding refugee status in the United States and in Taiwan, do you see that there's going to be an internationalization of kind of protest movements? Are they going to move away from physical spaces within Hong Kong? And find other kinds of spaces in order to uh, create new new ways to protest. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, I've been talking to activists based in, in actually Seattle, in Vancouver, uh, Toronto, in Montreal, in North America, and also in Australia and and UK and continental Europe. So they were actually step up their organizing effort. I think it's quite interesting that. Uh, we tend to think Hong Kong, Hong Kong migrants are everywhere. Hong Kong, like, they have Ghanese presence in Canada. Um, but uh, usually they were not involved. But when they were involved, they usually have to do with political incidents. Like 
actually in the 90s, what the, the main issue was Tiananmen. Tiananmen. So Tian, that you have Vancouver that protest, uh, because Hong Kong never really care about Tiananmen. So Tiananmen became the issue to unite the Hong Kong residents there. And the next one will be 2014 Umbrella Amendment, but it just quickly vanished. But this time it's definitely different because you see that, well, for example, in the past they don't like, they don't lobby the government. Now, uh, Hong Kong, uh, say, out in Australia, Canada, US are trying to lobby the government. And second, I think they are more aggressive to organizing their diasporic communities. And even among graduate students, you see activity coming out of that. And lastly, I think there have been more dialogue from different corners. So I see, I actually attend a lot of webinars of Hong Kong uh, uh, overseas community. Some of them are based in North America, some of them are based in Australia, some are based in Asia. So you see a pan, a global connection coming up. What I really have in mind is actually the overseas Taiwanese since the 60s that you have overseas Taiwanese get united with Tong Xiang Hui in, in North America. And that, that become a main force to push Taiwan toward the law of democratization. So what are, we are witnessing right now is that Hong Kong you know, maybe are just use the playbook of Taiwanese people before. Uh, so I don't know, it's just a beginning. Even in Taiwan, you see Hong Kong are organizing their organization. But in the past, they just have only Tong Xiang Hui and Tong Xiang Hui, you always See, oh, that's for all older people. Yes, they are all for older people. Now, younger people get involved, and they 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 were recruiting members. They were actually like immigrants in Taiwan. They try to promote some activities to let them know more about Taiwan. And also, uh, in 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 university, there are Hong Kong uh, new Hong Kong club being set up to for those people who are really concerned about Taiwan, whether they are Hong Kong or Taiwanese. So you see organizing effort on many fronts and. So uh, my expectation is that they, they may create a new interesting international front of that movement, um, which is going to evolve over the years. What are the, the other impacts of the pandemic and the national security law on the protests in Hong Kong? Okay. Um, well, uh, well it, it, uh, since this January, so the Hong Kong government issue, I think, like, Actually, actually, there's an interesting, uh, the, a lot of dictators use the pandemic to crack down the dissidents and cause some, some news outlet that is critical of, of the government. And also because the pandemic become a perfect excuse to outlaw rally. And Hong Kong people, Hong Kong government do that. So this year actually marked the first year that uh, Tiananmen Memorial Gathering was not allowed on June 4th. This year is the 31st anniversary. That in the past 30 years, Hong Kong people were allowed to gather in Victoria Park to commemorate that event. And this year is, they have to do that illegally and people were arrested out of that. So Hong Kong people will use, Hong Kong government using that just like other dictators. It's a perfect excuse and moment to expand their power to surprise the decent and people do that. And also, that's one side of story. The other side of story is that people really get scared to get infected, so that's why big rally were not that many. And so that was the immediate impact of COVID-19. And still right now, government was using this uh, anti, uh, social distancing order to suppress all the requests, all the application for rallies and, and gatherings. So that's, that's, that's it. Uh, liberation theology has been the backbone of many historical movements in places such as the US, Latin America, and South Africa, etc. Do you see liberation theology being internalized in the recent movements in Taiwan or Hong Kong? Well, uh, my understanding is that liberation theology is more of South American things. But having said that, um, I think in both Hong Kong and Taiwan, Christian church are involved in a number of social movements. Um, like for example, the three main leaders of the the umbrella movements, they are all Christians. One of them are priests, are priest, actually a priest, Baptist priest. Uh, and in Hong Kong, a lot of, because the Communist Party is atheistic, so Christian community usually have traditional problem with the communist society. But over the year, I think Beijing has made some inroad among those conservative uh, churches in Hong Kong. So some actually, you, in Hong Kong, you, 
you know some church are poor Beijing in, in the school year, but that's a true, okay? So because of the growing influence. But in a number of protests, especially in Hong Kong, that for example, some church become more active, they provide sanctuary for those who, for, for protesters who, who have no place to stay. And also some, they hire, they hire some people to do social work because they were, dis, they were, they were discharged by their, their organization, their employer. So ch church are involved. And also because of that, actually uh, Taiwan church also had some connection with the Hong Kong church. So you see Hong Kong, Taiwan connection, some of them were done by through our church network. For example, last summer we had a lot of material supply like mask uh, being transferred, delivered to that way. Also, some Hong Kong refugee come to Taiwan. Some of them, the first, for some of them, the first stop is local church. And also, because of more refugees come to Taiwan, some churches were operating Cantonese service out of that. And that was, and also some of, but again, I, I think both in Taiwan and Hong Kong, church had many orientation, some are more conservative, some are more active. So if we look at the active participation, they, they were really substantially involved, but but we have to remember remember that they do not represent the Christian community. Some of them really are some of the community Christian are really for government and they are conservative. So it's quite a diverse landscape. But even for those who are involved, I don't think they will call it a they would justify their involvement in line of the liberation theology. They have their theological reasoning and for being actively involved, but I don't think they're coming from liberation theology. What would motivate an outside country to assist Hong Kong? And maybe I'd like to just add something to that. Um, how do you think protests play into this? You know, does it does it help to motivate outside countries to assist in Hong Kong or in Taiwan? Uh, I think what Hong Kong did last year was they were very, I think they, they won the PR front in, in the mind of international media. You have so many uh, just uh, camera friendly, uh, photogenic picture, like human chance. This is a protest metaphor that is familiar with the Western people since the Baltic Way 30 years ago. So it's a peaceful and vivid demonstration, and it's so peaceful. And so, so, uh, so, uh, I, and also because, as I said before, Hong Kong happened to be a, a area where media outlets are concentrated. So a lot of foreign, I talked to uh, like Wall Street journalists stationed in Hong Kong. They, they, they happen. Their office happened to be the hard zone of confrontation. And Hong Kong journalists were actually they take come back training. Actually, it's a it's. But the report on the ground is more like a war zone correspondent. So, so and a lot of well, a lot of them well are fully full vest. So, so actually they have experience and know the police were doing something that they shouldn't do. So, international media are really harsh on Hong Kong's government because the the, the frontline journalists witnessed that. So, out of that, I think Hong Kong people really want the sympathy on the international media front. And I think a number of international leaders' expression um, are, are reacting to that because they are witnessing a, a gross human rights confrontation. So one of the weapons is international sympathy. I think Hong Kong protests are successful on that front. But when it comes to government, I think government decisions are really made on not just sympathy. You, you, you have to take hard interest, commercial interest, Political interest, uh, military interest, to motivate a government this uh, this policy. So I think uh, so I think to uh, to influence the government decision. Like for example, Hong Kong is now treated as a special entity, even though it belongs to PRC. But like in US, you have a Hong Kong Policy Act that treat that gives special privilege in terms of tariff. Uh, uh, a, a visa to Hong Kong people, and that was really not at stake right now because the U.S. government are evaluating whether they are going to hold that, and that will be a de devastating blow to Hong Kong uh, and also the Chinese interest in Hong Kong. And in order to act to that, I think you have to demonstrate that it's not just sympathy, the different. And over the world, I think more oh, probably out of COVID-19 and over out of a lot of, I think, blunder created by PRC government. So I think more and more government are 
are reacting harshly toward Beijing. And, and although they may, this decision may not be made in considering that they are sympathetic, they are sympathetic to Hong Kong people, but they just reacting to Beijing as well. That's why they will try to do something about Hong Kong. So more China, uh, China factor were, were, were weighted when different government were trying to re-evaluate their Hong Kong approach. Uh, let me just ask one more question. I, as a historian, I like to think about kind of long-term historical changes. Um, and I know that there's a debate in uh, Taiwan studies about the democratization process of Taiwan. Do you see the Sunflower Movement as the culmination of a democratization transformation that began with the Dong Wai in the 1970s? Yeah. Or do you see it actually as something different, like um, as symbolic of a mature democracy? Uh, or somewhere in between. I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts on that and also your thoughts about the future of uh, protest movements in Taiwan. Do you think that Thank we will you. continue to see that? Thank you, James. Go back to um, <laughs> issue in Taiwan. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. some from movement, of course, represent a very in interesting episode in Taiwan's democracy. I think one of the defining moments there, if you want to pick up a significant event, I think. In this century, I think some of our movement would definitely be one of them. But looking back, what happened in 2000, from 2008 onward, you have a uh, woman down coming back, and you have Manjo coming back. So people were really expecting to have a new period. But the students who were in the some our movement will actually get active starting 2008 with the so-called wild strawberry movement. And they got involved in different issues. They become well connected, and they become more experienced, and that, that's why they emerge as some pro leaders. Lin Feifang would be the perfect example of the value. Look at his trajectory. But prior to the some pro movement, actually there had been a discourse and narrative among the participants that Taiwan democracy is witnessing a crisis, a, a slide back toward authoritarianism. Let me give you a quick example of wild strawberry movement in 2008. That happened just four months after Manjo took place. And that was because Ch uh, Manjo is promoting a uh, cross-strait uh, conciliation. So that's why uh, PRC sent is uh, a delegate to Taiwan. And in order to welcome that delegate, the Taipei Street was put on heavy policing. A lot of protests were being, that you view wave of Republic of China flag, you will be taken away by police. But you see people wave PRC flag, they were welcome as guests. So people were really angry about that. That's why we have this student got involved in the so-called wild strawberry movement. So that one of the slogans is that we have a new experience of martial law. So, and that, that kind of slogan kind of uh, become viral and in a number of issues. So there was a, a, a narrative or a, a, a sense that uh, with the woman done coming back, we, we are going back backward. So, so, and some of our movement was actually an expression of that and the anxiety that because we want to build a closer relation with China so that democratic procedures can be violated, even even uh, uh, the lawmakers of different parties had agreed on certain procedures to process that free trade agreement. But once Ma ying get gave that order, the, the, the agreement can, the, the, the agreement how to process that agreement can be just broken. So th that, that was a narrative that they have to save democracy. So actually, it's out of the sense that democracy might be danger, in danger in that context, the, the some for our movement just emerged. So, so back to your question, I, I, I kind of, it's not that entirely precise if you want to characterize that as the, the, the combination of pro-democracy movement. Actually, that it's more like a, people were threatened, they, have this, they want to save something from worse. So, but its importance in Taiwan's political history is definitely, I mean, you look at the consequence out of that. The Liberal is no some problem. I don't think TPP will come in back to a power. So that's definitely a very major issue there.